the mic and make sure it sound right, boy. Episode 242, this is Alpha Mike, transmitting high atop of Florida's Peninsula, 108 feet. Today we feature the French Connection. We definitely have a lot that we're going to talk about today. The French Connection was that movie that you might have seen on television, where it has that incredible, incredible car chase that instead of chasing another car, it's actually chasing a train. But our episode is based on reality, not on fiction. That movie is pure fiction. Today, The French Connection, we will cover part of the Wise Guys series when we talk about the involvement of the Lucchese crime family in this episode. How to get in contact with us is real easy. RaiderCop.com will take you to the audio portion of our website where you can hear all our shows from number one to number 242. And RaiderCopNation.com, our official website, will give you more information and future and past episodes that you can tune into. You can always hear the podcast wherever you get your podcast. We are in all networks. Apple, Google, Spotify, Pandora, you name it, you'll find us. Raider Cop, Raider Cop Podcast for Raider Cop Nation. We will appear. And you know, as I always say, we live in troubled times. And you need that protection don't leave the house without it and you have maybe a car, a permit to carry concealed you have the latest weapon on you you have maybe the best rounds that you can find in today's market and you're fashionable with a brand new holster You've practiced at the range day in and day out, but that's only half of what you need. The other half is protection for the aftermath, and that comes in the form of the USCCA for little as $39 all the way up to $49. You can get three packages, one of the three packages that fits your wallet for pennies on the dollar. You know, the expense of going to court for whatever reason because of you practicing and believing in your Second Amendment is nothing to play around with. So I encourage you to be a member of the USCCA. It's as simple as going to your smartphone and tapping in the word Raider, R-A-I-D-E-R, at 80. 80- 87222 and there you can go on the road to become a member of the USCCA. Now a little announcement on that. I received a notice from the USCCA and we will no longer be affiliated with them as the end of August 31st. Now before you jump to conclusions and you're picking up that phone to tell people the latest gossip, it, uh, it's some partnership regulation that you have to have, uh, I believe it's 2,500 clicks a month. And uh, we didn't reach that level, but uh, I'm still a firm believer in the USCCA. So with uh, affiliation or no affiliation, I'm always going to encourage our audience to be well protected so you know back in uh, the summer of 2020 everybody that was an affiliate had received this notice that uh, they were doing some type of inventory of associates 
And uh, it took like forever. It took like two or three months to get the okay, we're back to normal. So I knew the things were on shaky grounds. And, uh, and then it was click here, click there, and uh, new terms of conditions and blah, blah, blah. So recently got that notice. And uh, so we will part our ways as, as partners, but I'm believing in the product we continue to be firmly hand in hand because I am a member of the USCCA regardless. If you've got that gun you've been dying to take care of, I mean, come on, you need a new trigger. You're looking at new barrels, maybe a nice little stippling job. You don't know where to go. Well, I know where you can go. The best armor in the business. Pistol Pete, the gunsmith down in Miami. The reason I know he's one of the best armorers in the country is because he was the armorer to thousands of officers in Miami, Miami Dade. There's no question he knows what he's doing. He's recently retired, opened up his own place, and that magic happens every day at Pistol Pete the Gunsmith. His information is down on the bottom of the show notes. It's as simple as just picking up your phone, you know, old-fashioned way. When you talk to a person, calling Pete, telling him what you want, he'll tell you how simple it is to send him your weapon. He'll fix it up to your liking and your specs and send that bad boy right back. You will thank me later. Today's episode, 242 French Connection. We are diving back into the Wise Guy series as we continue to drive into the Lucchese crime family. Now, of course, we started off with the inception is always 1931. That's our date when Lucky Luciano created the commission of Costa Nostra. And we are somewhere in the area between the 60s and the 70s. We have explored... And we will continue to explore Corona, Queens, where the Lucchese crime family during the 40s, 50s, and 60s, and part of of the 70s, they dwelled for many, many decades there. But today we're going to jump into the French Connection and we'll explain, is the Lucchese crime family the only family involved? No. There are other families in Gulfstream Nostra that were involved to a certain extent. There are other criminal organizations. And there's even an intelligence kind of spin to this whole thing, you know, spies and CIA. And we'll talk about all that. But we've come to that part in the show that I've got to talk about 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, better known as the train wreck in the White House. And we have to look at what the old goof has done. And we've got his three stories. It's time to talk about living in the Bolshevik states of woke. And our first story takes us from the train wreck in the White House. Joe Biden awarding congressional gold medals to those that defended the Capitol on January 6th of 2021. This is the day that lives in infamy, lives in the hearts and minds of every liberal and leftist in America. They won't allow or let January 6th disappear into the wind. No, according to them, it was a fierce battle that ensued in taking over the Capitol. The lives of all congressmen and senators were in peril. There was no hope. It looked doomed and gloom for them. But then bright sunshine came And the fearless Capitol Police defended them, and they lived to tell tell the tale. That's right, folks. The left will not allow January 6th to die. 
So they recruited Uncle Joe in handing out gold medals to these wonderful Capitol Police. Now, as you know, we are very pro-police here because we actually took part in that career. But let me tell you about the career that I was a part of. There are such things as readiness drills. We'll explain that in other episodes at a later time. But it's about your readiness for whatever comes your way. And I don't know about you, but I know that I saw a whole lot of mistakes. For example, Capitol Police officers holding the door for the insurrectionists to enter and take pictures. As they greeted them at the door, come on in, come on in. And people gradually just walked in. Of course, we have some episodes where there was rock thrown and broken window here and there. But something tells me that in their manual of training, it doesn't say in the middle of an insurrection, you shall open the doors of the Capitol and greet the insurrectionists as they enter to take over the country. It's a bunch of baloney that will continue in the leftist little hearts and minds until they come up with a better cape. Our second story takes us also with Uncle Joe, where people in the Democratic Party are a little upset with Uncle Joe and they want him to do more so he can get his loser nominee for the ATF nominated and appointed. You see, he's stagnating, drowning. They've thrown him an anchor. It is so bad that the left media now is distancing themselves. They are paddling as fast as Joe Biden dropped votes in the wee hours of the morning to back away from the train wreck nominee Since he came out on Chinese TV a while back to talk foolishness about America. Oh, but he forgot to mention that. And now it's come to light. So, as every senator and congressman look the other way, it looks like Joe won't be able to push this group over the finish line. And our third story takes us to Uncle Joe's immigration promises. The detention soars despite Joe's campaign promises. You don't know what's going on, but Joe gave us so many promises when he was running for president. And they were tabulating all the ballots. (laughs) But immigration really didn't happen the way he had forecasted it. There are hundreds and thousands packed in like sardines. They're being transported with little to no screening all around the country. Now, if you continue talking about this, you will get censored on whatever technology site there's out there. doesn't matter because they're all down with the left. And that brings us to the conclusion of this week's disaster in 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue and Uncle Joe. But remember, I told you, where there is gloom, there is light. And now it's time for the joke of the week. I've picked out this joke myself just for you. There was an original joke there, but I said, no, this one's a lot better and they'll appreciate it. So, here we go. Husband looks at his wife in surprise. Wow, darling. You look all different and nice today. Is that a new hairdo? The wife hisses behind him. I'm over here, Arnold. Well, look, act like it's never happened to you. All right, it's okay. Today's episode 242, French Connection, as we jump on the Wise Guys series. We've got a lot to talk about, and uh, this episode might go a little longer than the usual because, boy, 
are we going to unpack some real good stuff for you today. So let's wait for our friends, the clowns, as they just finished on their Mambo birthday celebration. And they are ready. Episode 242, French Connection. We've got a lot we're going to talk about today on the Wise Guys series dealing with the Lucchese crime family. Now, French Connection, you know it and I know it as a movie that was done in the early 70s. And to some extent, they've abstracted that movie from a lot of real stuff but then they put it into Hollywood phony mode and created the French Connection movie with Gene Hackman, which was, by the way, a very good movie. But the real detail was called Operation Shamrock. And through Operation Shamrock, would, it would derive the French Connection. Now, the reason it was so confusing for a lot of people, you see, this connection did have to do with some French people, and it goes all the way back to the 1930s. So Operation Shamrock was originally a couple of New York City detectives that were following a wise guy around, thinking they were dealing in something else and they stumbled upon this heroin operation that the media fastly dubbed the French Connection. So let's take a look at what was Operation Shamrock. And it's going to deal with, in the Lucchese crime family, Carmine Tremonti. Better known as Mr. Gibbs, born October 1st, 1910, he would become the boss of the Lucchese family after Three Fingers Tommy Brown died. Now, a lot of people say, well, he was appointed by the commission. Well, he was appointed by, well, and there's all speculation. The bottom line is the Lucchese crime family was going to go into the same modus operandi as the Genovese family in confusing authorities of who the real boss was once Tommy Lucchese died of brain cancer in 1967. As a result, the real boss, which was going to be Anthony Corallo, had indictments that were coming his way. We we covered this all on Eddie Coco as well. He takes over the leadership towards the end of 1967 and refuses to give it up until somebody tells him what exactly was going down. That person that told him, as we discussed in that episode, Anthony Corallo goes down to Florida and tells Coco everything is fine and Carmine Tromonte will take over as the boss. Now, the boss, because he was beneficial for all the factions in the Lucchese crime family, because authorities will look at him and not the true identity that they were trying to keep somewhat of a secret. And here's a perfect example. When uh, Carmine Tremonti gets indicted, that's probably, I think, 1972, and goes to jail. 
how come he just didn't retain the boss? I'm the boss and I'm, that's it. No, he goes off to jail on a 15-year sentence that dies five years later. But there was no rumble on the street because Anthony Corral took over. Okay, so we settled that because the mafia experts out there are going, no, 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 this guy don't know what he's talking about. Call again, Brito. There's no way in the world, okay? Read A Man of Honor from Joseph Bonanno. And I know uh, he's a rat. Don Louis, eh, all this baloney. He's an original. And he talks about a family's affairs or a family's affairs, okay? So that's all baloney that the commission and they're not going to get involved in any of that stuff so um, a lot of hype for nothing anyway Operation Shamrock would uh, come through a surveillance that these uh, police officers or detectives were doing of a wise guy we'll get into that a little bit further in but B you know the boss of the Lucchese crime family in charge would be Carmine Tremonti, no doubt about it. In fact, he was probably the lead over a lot of families as well. So there were other families, and we'll discuss that in a minute, that were also a part of this, but the Lucchese would take the lead because they actually did a lot of the negotiations with the French. So, if we look at the French connection, actually it goes back to the 1930s, and it is a group of French gangsters that come from uh, the, from Corsia, and they are a small little island off the uh, coast of France that they are into heroin and heroin in a big way. They're all, you know, have in, basically moved a lot of their heroin through Asia. And then there was a connection for a long period of time through Turkey into Europe. And then eventually it would get sent to America through various outlets. And we'll discuss that when we start talking about some of the other made members that were a part of the, what is called the French Connection. So these uh, Frenchmen were big into the, the the importation of heroin into not only America, but a lot of other places around the world as well. Um, in 1960, which is a very important date, the ambassador of Guatemala he gets stopped in somewhere in Europe, I believe it was Brussels or something like that, uh, trafficking this heroin in suitcases. His name was Mauricio Rosal. And there it triggered an investigation. Why would an ambassador of a country be trafficking heroin? Well, I got an idea. It dealt with money. And it opened up investigations in Europe that would eventually lead to Americans getting involved in it too. Now, during these investigations in the 60s and even earlier than that, it would be under the Federal Bureau of Narcotics. Now, before the DEA, that's what existed. Now, what's going to be real interesting, we're going to take you on a little journey here of confusion that the majority, the vast majority of Americans don't even know that existed. The Federal Bureau of Narcotics was actually dissolved in 1968. But the DEA did not start till 1973. Now, I was pretty good at math when I was a kid. 68 to 73, that's five years that just disappeared Who's in charge of drugs? Well, during this time, there's some shenanigans that are, are starting to move forward, you know. And as a result of that, that kind of uh, 
opens up an avenue for our beloved CIA to operate. But let's backtrack a little bit on the French connection starting in the uh, 1930s. Now, this heroin that they were doing, they had, they had uh, laboratories in Marcel, France, ever since 1937. So the heroin would come from Asia, go through Turkey, end up in France and Marcel, these laboratories would process it and get it ready so you could go around the world, but mostly uh, to America. Now, the, the Corsican gangs that were part of the distributing the heroin into France, they were actually, now get a little close to the speakers so you can understand how treacherous our governments are. They actually were protecting the Corsican gangs in the 30s and 40s and 50s and maybe towards the end of the 50s they stopped through something called the CDECE. Now, the initials are in French and I'm not going to torture you with me attempting to read French, but basically it's the French equivalent to the CIA. And after the Second World War, there was an exchange to stop French communists. So the S-D-E-C-E, together with the CIA, which really wasn't called the CIA at that time, they backed the Corsian gangs as long as they stopped French communists. That's all they had to do. Now, you're going to look at that in history, and, you you know, a lot of this guy's a conspiracy theorist. But isn't it fascinating, for example, Meyer Lansky in America would go around beating up on Nazi sympathizers. They, Meyer Lansky through Lucky Luciano protected the peers in America after they were contracted by the United States government to do so. After the invasion of Sicily in the Second World War, the United States Army allowed the mafia to control Sicily. Aren't these things just strange? Rick Ross, the famous drug dealer from Los Angeles that, gosh, I think he did 20, 30 years. I'm not really sure right now. But he's active, but very well spoken, by the way. And he's actively talking about uh, that the mass amount of cocaine that went into Los Angeles was as a result of uh, the CIA. And it had to do with uh, arming the Contras and and they needed money and so forth. So pouring cocaine into the minority areas or the ghettos, and especially in this case, Los Angeles, Rick Rose be became a very rich drug dealer, but at the end, he would get arrested for it. Now, he wasn't, this, this is his crazy conspiracy. See, his attorney obtained the information in discovery detailing these CIA plots of moving this cocaine for arms. But he got 20, 30 years, whatever they gave him anyway. So it's fascinating how a lot of crime have always something to do with our government. If it's the three initials, it's either CIA or FBI. They are starting to disappoint us more and more every day. We're starting to see a bigger picture of who they really are. Now, another thing that we've discussed in the past, the primary investigative agency in America for drug cases is, I don't have the drum roll, but if I had one, we'd do the drum roll, FBI. Not the other three initials, CIA. It is the FBI. And the re and it's not the ATF either or the DEA. You can do all the three initials you want. 
It's the FBI. The reason that the FBI sees that moment, remember we have a five-year gap here of who's going to be investigating drugs. It was called the Federal Bureau of Narcotics. Then it turns into some other crazy initials. And eventually that goes up in smoke in the 70s, early 70s, and the DEA is born in 73. But during that time, the FBI got approval by Congress to be the primary investigators of all drug cases. And another reason that the FBI did that because they would secure the funding. You know, when they seize all this money from drugs, the FBI could get to keep it. So, again, moves that our country does when no one is paying attention. We go on and we go into the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, like I explained, and there was a connection in the French connection that not everybody is Costa Nostra. The, the deal with the French connection actually deals with Sicilian Mafia, totally different from Costa Nostra in America. You have the Corsican French gang, and I'm sure there are other gangs that are transporting from Turkey into France and so forth. So this, this is a huge operation. It would later, turn in the 70s and 80s and 90s, turn into the Colombians and the Mexicans in an exchange for heroin for cocaine and heroin for marijuana. And so this thing would turn into an octopus with a lot of a lot of hands and a lot of avenues and a lot of criminal organizations. Now, the French had a leader by the name of Jean Gian, and he was known to Costa Nostra over the phone when they would talk about He was, in their mind, he was their leader. He was the leader of the French side, and they called him the giant because he was the tall guy. Now, he basically... Uh, his, and I'm going to read an article about him from uh, the New York Times, and it's, uh, you know, dated uh, December 15, 1972, when the New York Times actually knew how to write real news articles. Today, they just read, prop, you know, communist propaganda. But back then, there was some semblance of media journalism, you know, that kind of thing. So let, let me prop that up and read it to you. So I got it up on the topoid here, and I'll, I'll read some of it. The New York Times, uh, as I said before, December 15, 1972 is the date. The real story behind the French connect- connection is slightly fictional film accounts for a smashing harrowing smuggling ring goes back to 1962. The leader of the ring was a tall, dapper Frenchman named Jean Gian, who was known uh, to the American connection who could not pronounce his name as the giant. Though his underlings, Gian, persuaded the French television performer named Jacques Aglivlin to smuggle 97 pounds of heroin into New York concealed in his 1960 Buick, which arrived here aboard a liner uh, a ship liner in the United States on January 10th. The New York City Police Department had some time been watching the intended American recipient uh, to uh, Anthony Fuca and his brother Pasquale. A taped telephone call from Gian to the Fucas reportedly put Detective Edward Eakin and colleagues on the trail of Frog One, that's what they called him, as Gian came to be known. So the New York City Police Department stumbles upon this in what is their Operation Shamrock. They're looking at these mobsters, Anthony Fuca and his brother Pasquale Fuca, and as a result, they don't know what's going on, but they're tailing them. 
and they go to the pier and they're paying attention to some shipping container and the 1960 Buick that comes out of the container everybody's interested in. So, of course, the cops came in, they seized it, they took it apart, and they found the 97 pounds of heroin. And all of a sudden, the investigation of what's going on is going to get a lot bigger. So, Jean Gian, he would be the French uh, part of this whole thing. He'd end up disappearing, just going back to France, never getting arrested, and uh, no clue about him later on. The the connection with Gian, uh, Jean Gian would go in the 50s and 60s with the Corson. He had an open warrant, by the way, Jean Gian, but it didn't matter because he disappeared. Uh, the connection then would start to go in Jean Gian with Carmine Tremonti. And we can go into, you know, Tremonti's bio, but the bottom line is he was a very powerful capo in the Lucchese crime family. After the death of Tommy Lucchese, like I said, they, they launch him into the front boss. And there was a lot of reasons for that. And that's what we're going to discuss now. Now, not only were the Lucchese crime family a part of this, so let's backtrack into the 1930s and 40s. The original Costa Nostra family that was dealing with these heroin guys from France or Corsina were the uh, Bonanno family. And as a result, excuse me, not the Bonanno family, the Traficante family in Tampa with Ignacio Antononori. And he was a big wheeler of heroin into this country, one of the biggest in the 1930s and 40s. Eventually, Joe Bonanno would get involved in it too. But of course, a boss could never deal with drugs or admit that they were dealing in drugs. There was no ban in the mafia at that time. The ban came in 1951 from the commission. No one really paid any attention to it. Then the new ban came in 1957 that imposed a death sentence on any member dealing in drugs. So Bonanno had been a key into the drug business, but of course he was going to distance himself. And his man, Flint, in the Bonanno family was Carmine Galante, better known as the Cigar Olilo. He would uh, really take a big, big portion of this heroin deal and uh, as we know he paid dearly with his life for it because bottom line is he was not respecting the accords that were done prior but then again Carmine Galante said when I was in prison everybody took uh, my 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 loads and my, my routes and everything else and he ends up executing six or eight Gambino uh soldiers and, and affiliates. So um, Carmine was nothing to, to sneeze at. He was, he was a real problem, Carmine Galante. And also the Genovese family in the 50s and 60s had Vincent Vinny Bruno Moro, 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 and he was also big into the heroin business. Everybody had their hand in some form or another in drugs, even the Provaccio Colombo family, but of course, the Provaccio family was probably the family with the least interested in it for whatever reason. So there was no, from the top, a wink and a nod, you got caught in it, you were dead. And that reigned in, in Persico, Carmen Persico's administration, all the way down from, from the beginning, all the way down to the present day. You get caught in dope, you're dead in the Colombo family. All these other families, well, when did he get made? Well, you know, he was actually made before the edict. Eh, eh, you know, like all that baloney. Now we have the famous ripoff. Now for this, we're going to have to read from the article that is dated uh, February 21st, 09. 
Now, this is really interesting because what happens is the 97 uh, pounds that we had discussed of heroin that was seized from that 1960 Buick in Operation Frog One would end up getting impounded in the New York City uh, Police Department and would sit in evidence for what they thought would de- over a decade. But in the 70s, they were actually discovered as the pile of heroin that was over in the corner had been replaced with flour. And as a result, the heroin wasn't there anymore. The 97 pounds had disappeared and had a street value of $70 million. It remained a mystery for many, many years what had, what could have happened. But in, uh, in the 2000s, the Lucchese crime family would have a rat infestation problem that wanted to talk to authorities about what he knew on the the heroin impound case that was a mystery for so long. He wasn't getting a lot of respect uh, on on the matter, so what they did was they uh, he wrote a book, and in his book he details names and so forth. Now, gas pipe which was the rat at the time, Casio, he he was the un- underboss, gets arrested, turns state's evidence on uh, everybody in the Lucchese crime family, cuts a deal with the government, and then they find some inconsistencies in the stories and they booted them out for the witness protection and they slam them with like 445 years or something like that. And he was dying to get back in to get a break. So he started dropping every dime he could drop in order to get out of his predicament. Now, before we look at the New York Times article on gas pipe and uh, the uh, relieving the New York City Police Department of the mystery by telling them that their heroin was seized by members of the Lucchese crime family, I want to backtrack into October 1957, and it's an important date. Now, remember that the Costa Nostra in America had placed a death sentence on any made member dealing in drugs. But at the same time, in October 1957, Sicilian mafiosos, mafia, and American Costa Nostra were meeting with uh, in, in in Palermo in the place in the Grand Hotel and they were discussing international heroin trade and the French connection. And in 1972 that would be part of Vincent Papa and his role. So these deals that would eventually lead into the French connection were actually done in October of 1957 in Palermo between American Costa Nostra and Sicilian Mafia. And the Sicilians would pick up from the course in the French gangs the heroin and then they would uh, process that to transport it to America, to Costa Nostra in, in America. So I wanted to take a little side note to clear that up, the hypocrisy of Costa Nostra. So you got a death sentence, anybody dealing in drugs, and then you you you're, you're you're in Sicily shaking hands over there on international herring trade business. But what are you gonna do? It's all about money. A lot of the bosses were the wink and the nod. Everybody else was hands off, go somewhere else because the money was huge. All right, New York Times article dated February twenty first, oh nine. In prison, far from Brooklyn haunts, where his name was Scald in blood, Anthony Castle sto- stews over old vendettas, his stew over betrayal and of fresh heart problems and prostate cancer. Mr. Ca- Castle 
the once feared underboss of Lucchese family, is now serving multiple life sentences amounting to 455 years for murder. Stews of his secrets, unsolved crimes that he says in an outpouring of letters he is eager to help close if only he could show the authorities where the bodies are buried, especially if it entails a trip outside the gates. Yep, gas pipe was going nuts in prison and he couldn't wait to make a deal with uh, the authorities to get him out of prison. I would go out there in a heartbeat, Mr. Council said on Friday in a telephone call to a former detective seeking the mobster's help in clearing his own name. But as much as he hoped for a taste of freedom or a reduction of his sentence, prosecutors questioned what his information may be worth and what pearl, pearls may lie in reopening contact with uh, Casio. Some compared to a fi- you know, his, his fictional character of Hannibal Lecter. Dangling a prize is the answer to one of New York's most scandalous mysteries, how 400 pounds, 400 pounds eventually would disappear of heroin and cocaine, much of it seized in the so-called French Connection drug bust in 1962, was spirited out of a police property vault for re, uh, resale back on the streets. By the time the record theft was discovered in December of 1972, the drugs then valued at $73 million had been replaced with flour and cornstarch. So Cassio would go on and, 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 and talk about who committed the deed. And there are four narcotics detectives, Mr. Castle wrote, the former detective, Pat Iritari, in October amplified information he offered in his 08 biography, one worked inside the property clerk's office, one he added was later shot to death. Mr. Castle said he remembers where the gun was thrown. Uh, but Mr. Castle 66, whose mob nickname was Gas Pipe, said he is having trouble with the exact location, so naturally he would like to get out if he, if only for a day to help uh, or at least win some leniency along the lines of his plea deal. He said to the government, uh, reneged on six and a half years in prison. Of course, he'd like to get out and he's serving 55 million years, said Michael F. Vicone, chief of racket division in the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office. Like other prosecutors, Mr. Visconti has little stomach for Mr. Cassio, but without any promise, he has arranged to visit Mr. Cassio on Thursday at the Federal Medical Center in uh, Butner, uh, North Carolina. So it goes on that they really don't want to deal with him, but he, Cassio, talks about the detectives that were in the, uh, the signing I mean, going back to who originally signed in, and the thing is a document that's about a decade old. So it led into such a mystery. Who did this? And the article talks about 400 pounds. Now, let me tell you, 400 pounds out of an evidence that that's a feat unto no... I mean, you've got to be real good. The street value in the 70 million, that was in the uh, 60s and 70s. So Costa and Nostra was making a lot of money. The Lucchese crime family pulled this heist off out of the uh, evidence property room in New York City. Uh, it will go on to talk about what we discussed in the last article, Mr. Fuca. So let's take a look at what this article closes out with. And it says the drugs at the core of the mystery popularized by the French Connection 
referring to the movie and the book, a 1969 book by Robin Moore and the Academy Award-winning film the following two years later were secreted in compartments in the 1960 Buick loaded aboard a liner United States sailing from Le Havre, France to New York. The car and its 112 pounds of heroin were later claimed by the Lucchese family underlying Paschi Fuca, who, as it happens, was being tailed by the pair of dodging New York narcotics detective Eddie Egan and Sonny Grosso. And, of course, the movie The French Connection with Gene Hackman is Eddie, uh, the life of Eddie Egan and Sonny Grosso. So, you know, but again, the movie goes into a more fictional aspect. The drug bust in January 1962 was widely held as a record, but heroic heroics provided short-lived in 60 thefts between March 1962 Nine and January 1972, someone signing the registered as Detective Joseph Nunzida, a member of the Narcotics Bureau of Wiley Corrupt Special Investigation Unit, and using fictional badge, badge numbers, removed the French Connection drugs along with another 300 pounds of heroin and cocaine from the police property vault at 400 Broom Street which is now the university uh, dorms for the New York University. And running analysis, I discovered fingerprints never established that Detective Nunzada actually signed the police register, but eight months before the theft were discovered, Detective Nunzada, charged with corruption in an unrelated case, was found shot to death in his car. It was ruled a suicide. Mr. Moore, the author, wrote that as far back as 1967, he and Detective Nunzada, Egan, and Grosso joked about stealing the French Connection heroin. So it was a lot of, uh, you know, who did it, who did it, who did it in the 70s when it was discovered. Many suspects emerged, including Vincent Papa, a major drug dealer, Frank King, a retired narcotics detective and a private eye working for Mr. Papa, and Mr. Interry, who upon his retirement had joined Mr. King as a bodyguard for one of Papa's, Mr. Papa's sons. Boy, there's a lot of, a lot of finger pointing here. But it would go on that a lot of these detectives would they would all have links uh, to the narcotics and to the Lucchese crime family. Now, Mr. Papa, which is uh, accredited with pulling this off, it says in the article that Mr. Papa's lawyers was, uh, Mr. Papa's lawyer was overheard on a wiretap asking Mr. King, do we have anything to worry about the handwriting analysis? After providing what he thought was confidential information on four corrupt narcotics detectives, Mr. Papa was stabbed to death in prison. So obviously, when the full attorney asked, do we have anything to worry about with the analysis that the cops are doing on the handwriting analysis? Well, they, they're telling on it themselves. So... Uh, the lawyer, I guess nothing happened to him, but Papa got stabbed in prison. I guess the Casey Crane family said, well, we got to cut our losses here. So it, it's it's a real interesting story. We could go on just on this one alone for a long time, but, you know, we got to keep it moving. The movie French Connection would star Eddie Egan and Sonny Grosso, two well-decorated New York City uh, detectives, and they would go on, and you know, their 1961, their, their heroin seizing of 112 pounds of heroin. They were legendary. Of course, the character in French Connector was Popeye Doyle, which was made up. His real name was Eddie Egan. Eddie Egan would go into acting as in Hollywood 
as, as, as a result, Sonny Grosso, his partner, also will become a Hollywood producer and so forth. So they made out very well out of this. So who says crime doesn't pay? They became uh, movie stars and movie producers. So we look at this French Connection case. There are many arms in this case. For example, the Bonanno crime family was pushing in massive amounts of heroin when Carmine Galante got back out in the street after serving over 20 years in prison. He immediately took back what was his, and as I said, he killed six to eight made members of the Gambino family that had moved in on his heroin routes. And he was treacherous. Why, where did he get the authority? Where did Tremonte get the authority to do this? Well, from October 1957 in the Grand Hotel in Palermo, there's where they got it. It was Costa Nostra that sat down with Sicilian Mafia, and Costa Nostra was represented by the Bernardo family, the Lucchese family, and I'm sure at some level, the Genovese and Gambino family. Colombo or Provacci never had their hand in any of that stuff. Uh, as I said, their edict was, get found with drugs, you're dead. Simple as that. Now, there, there is a, a slight link to that that has to do with Joseph Provacci being positioned as the boss of that family. He was not, uh, how do you say, a wise guy or anything like that. He was a businessman, supposedly. And and this, like in 1927, 1929, in a meeting in Cleveland, they give him the nod to take over from another hoodlum in Brooklyn, which would become the Provacci family. So, the rumor is that the, he had relatives in Sicily that were big in heroin, and he always distanced himself from that. That must have been a part of that original arrangement of giving him his own family. He could not deal in this business because he'd have an advantage over everybody else. So that's why most likely they kept away from uh, all that type of attention. Up next, we've got Joe Narrows Loratro. We go back to the streets of Corona when we look at illegal gambling in a huge way. $15 million a year he'll be pouring in to the bank accounts for the Lucchese crime family. That's episode 243, a part of the Wise Guys series as we continue. We've got much more to go on, on, you know, we're going to start breaking these episodes up. They're going to be a lot more interesting as far as we're going to get really deep into firearms, really deep into Costa Nostra, or Mafia, or Wise Guys, whatever you want to call it. And we're going to have one to two shows that are really deep into the political atmosphere and what's going on specifically dealing with police. A lot of uh, hacked police chiefs, their masks are starting to come off. So we'll be at the ready when they do fall off, so we'll catch it and we can identify who they are. But that's coming soon. As we close, we close with the word of the week. And today, from the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 12, verse 13, and it says, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. And we're working on that AWOL section on the website coming out soon. We're going to start pouring in there with some AWOL good words, 30 minutes or less, the powerful word of God for your life to pick you up. As always, it is my honor and pleasure to be your host on Radio Cop Podcast. Continue to pray for yourself because without you in the game, we have nothing. 
continue to pray for your family, your community, the law enforcement agencies that serve you. And I hear those sirens. And most importantly, before I run out of here, remember to keep praying for the United States of America. This is Alpha Mike, and I'm out.